Hey bookends! Welcome to 10 Minute Book Review. I'm 10. As you may have noticed, my background is a little different. That's because I'm not filming in my studio today because my son is using that for homeschooling. So I am in my home office. So yes, you can't see it, but in front of me is a very large table filled with very random things such as uh, supposedly healthy treats from Trader Joe's pumpkin flavored because I love them and pumpkin batons because I love them and spicy mangoes because I love them because when you grow up with an ethnic family you love things that are spicy but yes so that's why my background is a little bit different because I am in my home office so jumping right on in this week's book review is from Mashani Chosky it is the Silver Serpents. Don't know if you can see it. But of course, we will have a little picture of it up. But yes, it is the sequel to The Gilded Wolves, which was a book that we thoroughly enjoyed that came out last year. So we like to start off every book review with a star point, as in out of 10 stars, how many stars does this particular book garner? And also a rating, as in if this was a movie or a TV show, what would it be rated? Star Point. It did not rate as high as The Gilded Wolves, but it was still really good. If we say 8 out of 10, a solid 8. So not teetering, two of me will both agree. This is a 8 out of 10. And for a rating... I would say this is a PG-13. There's nothing particularly graphic done, but there are some graphic things that are mentioned. Uh, to give an example, there is sex, but the sex is not described as kind of an afterthought or a beforethought. Like it'll say something to indicate that someone's about to have sexual relations and then it'll stop. Or it'll indicate that someone had sexual relations prior and it'll keep moving. So yeah, about PG. 13, there's some violence, but it's mentioning more so violence than <coughs> actual heavy violence happening. So yeah, let's get into the actual review. Now, even though this is a sequel to The Gilded Wolves, wolves, um, you don't have to have read The Gilded Wolves in order to enjoy this book because it does give you the flash pan details from the previous book, such as um, what happened to a character by the name of Tristan, why what happened to him has influenced everyone else in the book. Uh, so I'm not going to really say what happened with Tristan because that might be a spoiler for those who are planning on actually reading the book. Um, but it does heavily affect what happened in this book. And it does tell you in this book, like right off the bat, what happened to him. So you don't have to really worry about that. So we meet Sevron again. So if you remember, Sevron was the owner of Le Eden which is a hotel in Paris, in this version of Paris. Uh, and he turned down his birthright of being a part of the guild. He is searching for a book, The Divine Lyric. And he believes that if he has this book, The Divine Lyric, that he'll be able to become a god and protect all of his friends. So to let you know where all of his friends are right now, Sophia has traveled back to Poland for, which she said it was for Hanukkah, but really it's because her sister is sick, and so she's trying to help her sister. Enrique is still a historian, but he is trying to go into historical lectures so that he can be seen as more than just Savron's historian, because he wants to kind of make a career out of it. Hypnos is still Hypnos, a flirt who will flirt with anyone. Although we can see now that his he's deeper than just a flirt in this book. We find out that it's, it's much deeper than that. But that is the the cloak that he hides behind, that he is just a simple flirt. And then finally, we have Layla. So Layla has gone into working in the burlesque, uh, burlesque place that she worked in before, but full time. So she's no longer a cook for Severon. So they've all gone their separate ways, kind of. Keep in mind, it's only been about two months since the happenings of the Gilded Wolves and the Silvered Serpents. So even though it's been a year for us, it's been only two months for them. 
when we read about what Severon wants to do and how he has changed in those two months, it's like, wow, this doesn't feel like the same person from the last book. Um, but he's become a bit hardened off of what happened to Tristan, what he believes he allowed to happen to Tristan, even though Tristan was his own human being who made his own decisions. But yeah, he feels as though he did not protect Tristan. And so he's going to do whatever he can to protect his friends. And it seems as though he goes to emotional extremes in regards to himself. So not emotionally extremes towards other people. He's not doing anything to hurt his friends. Well, mm. he does things that could be construed as holding his friends back so that they can go in the direction that he feels as though he needs them to go in order to achieve the ultimate goal that he feels as though he needs to get to protect them all. But he's not physically abusive. He doesn't play mind games or emotional tricks on them or anything like that. But as a reader, if you didn't read the first book, you kind of think of him as kind of a jerk. Like if you don't meet him in the previous book, you think he's just a jerk. But in the previous book, the ending of the previous book, you see that he went through something highly traumatic. But all of his friends is basically a Russian roulette of which one of his friends is going to be killed. And he went for the friend that he felt the most for. And it turned out someone else was going to be harmed instead. And what hurt him in that was that he was made to choose. He was forced into a position where he had to choose between the people that he loved. And that's a position that no one should ever want to be in. It was like having to choose between a spouse and a child. And that was similar to the situation that he was put in. And it kind of revealed to him who meant the most to him. <coughs> And it also revealed to him that in his mind he was not strong enough and also in his mind he did not do enough to protect someone else. And so he is willing to go through any extreme to make sure that these centralized people that he loves, excluding Hypnos, these centralized people that he loves are able to survive. So the premise of the book is that they have found the divine lyric or at least a way of finding the divine lyric and they all have to head to Russia in order to get it. In Russia there is the fallen house which uh, was kicked out of the guild because of their practices of doing different things that were uh, inhumane and just wrong. Now the guild that is in Russia they are more concerned with learning than acquiring riches so they're one of the poorest guilds but they're also one of the most knowledgeable guilds so they head out to russia it's the whole gang all back together severon enrique Layla, zofia and with the addition of hypnos now hypnos is supposed to be having a romantic uh situationship <laughs> i guess you can call it <coughs> That's my husband dying in the background. He's good. He just put his hand up and said he's good. Uh, but yes, he's kind of in a romantic situationship with Hypnos. And I say a situationship because on his end, he feels as though this is a relationship. On Hypnos' end, this is just a fun thing to be in until something else happens. We kind of find out later that Hypnos is using Enrique. But that's not really news based on how Hypnos behaves. He's not a bad person. He is an opportunistic person. He is going to get what he wants and try to create as little collateral damage in the process. There's even one point in the book where he says, I could grow to love you. So it lets Enrique know that he never really had any feelings for him. There are other things in the book that kind of let that be known too. And I'm very proud of how Enrique handled the situation. Um, also too, something else that I liked about the book is how Zofia once again is being portrayed. So it doesn't explicitly say it because I believe this book is supposed to be made in the 1800s, 1700s, something to that effect. But Zofia is supposed to be autistic. And a common portrayal of people with autism is that they have no emotions. They don't want to look people in the eyes. They don't want to be around people. They don't want to have friends. That is most certainly not the case. My son is autistic and he is one of the most <clears throat> loving little people who has ever existed. He looks everyone in the eyes when he wants to talk to them. 
you know, it, it, there's this classic autistic Rain Man portrayal that is in the media, like every autistic person behaves in, in a particular way. The extreme part of the spectrum, but most autistic people are in the extreme and it does them a, even the ones who are in and are in the extreme, it does them an extreme discredit to make it sound as though they don't have feelings or they don't feel deeply or they can't express emotion or they don't want to be around people. When they are human beings who of course have emotions, they're not sociopaths, they have emotions, they may not know how to show them properly all the time, they may not know how to express them or reciprocate them all the time because autism is a learning disability, not a mental disability, but they do have them. And so that is beautifully shown in Zofia. Uh, forging is not a magic trait, it is a scientific trait. So some people are able to do it, some people aren't. But basically it's able to manipulate the molecules or atoms or what have you. And one thing to cause it to do something else. Kind of like alchemy, except you're not changing the... Hmm, you're not changing the properties of the thing. You're just changing the use of it. So like on alchemy, the whole purpose of alchemy is to be able to turn uh, product A into gold or to create something new from something that's not it. So with forging, that's not the case. So if someone has gold and they create a gold bear, it'll be a gold bear. It'll be a bear made of gold, but this gold bear will be able to walk or growl. It'll have some sort of purpose. It's not alive. But it'll have some sort of purpose and to be me mechanized to guard a home or uh, mechanized to lift things. But that's how it works. So when Layla was born, uh, she was born sickly and, and dead or nearly dead. And so there was a woman in her village who was able to forge her back together using other parts. So she's still a human being and she's still Layla, but she was put together using forging. And so it said that she won't live to see her 20th birthday unless she's able to get the divine lyric so she has this added measure this added need i should say to get this book and when she tells zofia and enrique about this zofia is like oh my god i cannot lose her she is my best friend i love her just as much as i love my sister i can't help my sister because her sister was sick with some sort of disease but i can help layla it wasn't like oh you're going to die Hmm. Or, oh, I need to help her because she benefits me. That's another thing in the media that people make autistic people out to be. They make them out to be selfish. As if, if this person doesn't benefit me in my life, then they have no purpose in my life. <clears throat> like, no, autistic people have fluff in their life, too. My son has friends that are completely useless. They're still his friends. They just don't serve a purpose. But, yeah, she doesn't feel like she needs Layla because Layla, without Layla, she's not going to be able to function. She needs Layla because Layla is her friend and she loves her friend. Also how everyone treats Zofia. They don't, so Zofia doesn't like things that look complicated. Like she doesn't want her food to touch. She prefers cookies to be white sugar cookies that are completely like plain looking with white frosting. And so there's a, a moment where her and Enrique are walking and he goes into a bakery and they have these sugar cookies with sprinkles on it. And so he buys them and asks the man to scrape the sprinkles off of the sugar cookies and then re-ice them so that they're smooth. And when she comes out of the store that she went into, he's like, hey, I got your cookies. He was being thoughtful. He wasn't just like, yeah, I know you're hungry, so you're hungry. Eat these cookies. No, he... he did what he could to make her feel comfortable. And she does the same thing for her friends. She is a full member of the team. So I also like how Enrique is portrayed. I think it's very obvious that he is bisexual, but his sexuality is not the mainstay of the book. I hate when someone's sexuality is the mainstay of, of a book because someone's sexuality isn't the mainstay of their life. No one's job is their sexuality. My job isn't asexual. No one's job is their sexuality. It, it just is what it is. It's just one facet in a multifaceted life of a human being. So I love that he is a multifaceted human being and that his sexuality is just one small facet of 
who he is. So when they get to Russia, they meet up with these new people. These new people, in my opinion, felt shifty from the beginning, from the start, but whatever. You're going to find out more about them if you read the book. There was a part in the book where I think some people will be of split mind. Like, I know how I feel about it. But I have talked to other people about this particular part of the book and they've had a uh, averse opinion to mine. So, Layla. So, the, it's Layla, Sevron, and this this other chick other chick let's call her russian chick so russian chick sees sevron and she's like wow he's cute because sevron is cute and Layla is posing as sevron's mistress so apparently back then it was perfectly classy to travel with a mistress so she's posing as his mistress and so the girl treats her like she's a mistress she's like okay well let's scoot her to the side you're of nobility, Sevron. I'm of nobility, Sevron. Why don't we go? And she says something off color to Layla. Something very off color <clears throat> to Layla, or I should say about Layla in front of her. And Sevron is about to say something, but he looks over at Layla and he steps back and lets her step forward. And Layla handles the handle. And in my opinion, Sevron did what was what he was supposed to do. Uh, if some chick was talking to my husband about me, and I'm standing right there, no, I don't want him to. No, I don't want him to say anything. Step back, because I'm gonna handle it. And she gonna know who handled her because she's gonna know he with me. And that's exactly what Layla did. She let her know. Chick, chill, he with me. Now, some people have a different mind. They were like, okay, so she said something bad about Layla. So Sevron should have been the one to <clears throat> step up to her and say something. Layla shouldn't have been the one to step up to her and say something. Sevron should. The problem I have with that is if it's two women basing on each other, it's one thing. If it's a man basing on a woman, all of a sudden the man becomes wrong. Even if the woman, even if what the woman was doing was wrong. The man automatically becomes wrong so it's better that the woman who is being disrespected checks the woman doing the disrespecting and every time that the girl's like oh well can i go without exploring Severon's like it's up to layla layla's like no he's like no my girl said no so the answer is no and the russian girl was like mad you know because it's like i'm noble and you're noble and she's just a mistress and he's like nah my girl said no, so the answer is no. Okay, everybody, we out. Uh, there were some... Yeah, so we, people are of different minds in regards to that. I'm I'm Club A. I'm like, yeah, Layla handled her handle, and that's what's supposed to have happened. So this book, the last book was a little bit dark. This book is very dark. It turns out that there are, being, there are girls who are being murdered. Not actively murdered right now, but were murdered in the past in an attempt to be able to get the Divine Lyric. Apparently, the girls are... Um, a, only a particular type of person can access the Divine Lyric. And it looks like it's female. And for some reason, it has something to do with their hands. So, yeah. So Layla ends up uh, discovering that some of the statues in the building that they go to, in the castle or a mansion that they go to, aren't actually statues, but the bodies of dead girls that have been mummified over time due to the ice. Of course, there are more riddles that are being solved, as in the first book. Um, so just like in the first book, each chapter is dedicated to the mind of a particular character, which is the main characters. You don't get to be in the mind of the uh, peripheral characters. And each character is fleshed out. Each character feels thoroughly alive. They don't feel like they're... Even the peripheral characters feel thoroughly alive. They feel like real characters. They don't feel like filler characters. So that's a wonderful thing the ending 
you know, before we go to the ending, I just want to talk a little bit about how Severon's past was like fleshed out. So apparently him and Hypnos were friends when they were little, little children, which is no secret. But Hypnos still wants to have some kind of friendship with Severon because he's like that he was as close as a brother to him. Now, because both of them were bastard children by women who were not considered of nobility, so I believe Severon's mother was from around Afghan, Afghanistan, something like that. And Hypnos' mother was from Haiti. So these women were considered not of nobility. So because these women weren't of nobility, they were considered to um, not have a place in the houses, so to say, in the gilded houses. And it was said the reason why Severon wasn't allowed to take over his father's house was because of Hypnos. So, yeah. Uh, the ending was pretty good, um, very cliffhangery. I thought there was going to be a duology, so apparently it is a trilogy. So yeah, there's that to look forward to. Hopefully the next book comes out next year, hopefully. It was a good read, um, you know, if you like this kind of story, kind of a buddy crime story. Not really thieves, but uh, kind of like Indiana Jones a little bit. In fact, I think it was funny how the author says she dedicates this to Nicolas Cage. And at the end of the book where she's talking about it, she says she kind of... It was at the end of the book a good read. She said that's kind of like National Treasure, but without Nicolas Cage. And it, it is kind of like National tre Treasure. This is buddy group of people looking for treasure. Except the difference is they're looking for it for different reasons, but ultimately to save each other's lives. So yeah, all in all, it was a really great book. We do recommend it. And if you like what you see, please like and subscribe. <laughs> Bye, bookends.